legitimacy of video games. Uh, it's no secret that video games are a massive cultural phenomenon. Uh, in 2010, there was 183 million Americans playing 13 hours of video games a week, an additional 5 million playing 45 hours a week. So, full-time job playing video games. <laughs> Hopefully on the side of something else productive they're doing. So. Um, so top tier titles now enjoy budgets in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, video games are everywhere from phones to tablets, TVs, everything. Uh, reactions to this phenomenon have ranged from outrage to zealous devotion. While these growing numbers of video games so often depict battles of all kinds, these games also continue to cause battles in the real world. One of the most poignant and passionate of these battles is for a sense of cultural legitimacy for the medium. Some proof that these unique blends of gameplay, narrative, graphics, music, and acting can amount to something spiritually and intellectually enlightening, even great art. Other mediums have fought and won this debate before. I argue that several of the key strategies video games need to win this battle in their own time can be found in the life and work of William Shakespeare. In many ways, video games today are fighting much the same battle that English theater was fighting in Shakespeare's day. While classical drama of Greek and Roman times was worthy of repute, in Shakespeare's time, his own medium, English language theater, was viewed in much the same fashion as the video games of our time. English theater in Shakespeare's day was literally not much removed from such cheap entertainments as bear baiting, thus Shakespeare's famous stage direction for the Winter's Tale, Exit Pursued by a Bear. Shakespeare's globe rose amidst displays of several cheap entertainments along the low cultural level of bear baiting, proving as well as anything just how low English drama was considered at the time. Civic officials often petitioned the royal council to abolish drama altogether, causing Shakespeare and other dramatists to build their theaters outside of the jurisdiction of London itself. Similar to video games enemies today, drama's opponents in Shakespeare Day objected to plays on both moral and academic levels. In 1579, Stephen Gosson wrote a lament on the destruction of England's dignity by way of plays. He argued that Ovid's theater charges his pilgrims to creep close to the saints whom they serve, but in the theaters of his, of his London, he saw only such heaving and shoving, such itching and shouldering to sit by women that is a right comedy to mark their behavior. Uh, in Sir Philip Sidney's Apology for Poetry, he claimed that our tragedies and comedies, uh, where you? our tragedies and comedies, not without cause cried out against, observed rules neither of honest civility nor of skillful poetry. While we revere Shakespeare in our time, perhaps more than any other playwright in history, Shakespeare wrote those same plays that we now know and love in an intellectual war zone. Uh, the late great film critic Roger Ebert didn't think video games could be art either. He didn't believe a game could connect with an audience on the same emotional and intellectual level as novels, theater, or film. No matter people's personal opinions, our culture agrees with Ebert. Parents the world over lament the amount of time their kids spend playing video games, yet those same parents would praise a child for reading for the same amount of time that they play a game. And in both cases, parents don't really look at the content of what their kid is inter interacting with, they just think book equals better than game every time. And additionally, if, a, if that child, rather than playing video games, read Shakespeare for that amount of time, those parents would tout it to the whole world, saying how educated and cultured their child was. <clears throat> but that's today. What many don't know, and others you too easily forget, is that young people attending English plays in Shakespeare's own time were viewed as even worse off than gamers are seen today. Gossen wrote that the common people which resort to theaters were but an assembly of tailors, tinkers, cord wainers, sailors, old men, young men, women, boys, girls, and such like, and felt that, in Andrew Gurr's words, people needed protection from the corrupting influence of experience like playgoing. What everyone regards now as beautiful and cultural was then ugly trash. The people that made up Shakespeare's earliest audiences were, effectively, the 30-year-old mother's basement gamers of their day. <laughs> <laughs> so despite that rough starting point for Shakespeare, he changed the artistic world forever. When asked about Shakespeare in an interview, video game designer Jonathan Knight said, he was an innovator and not just a great storyteller. Arguably, he's more of a medium innovator. Knight makes a valid point here. All scholars and even most students realize that Shakespeare wrote very few original plots and mostly just converted stories from other mediums to the stage, or even from other stage productions to his own. Uh, Knight specifically cites Hamlet, but King Lear, Romeo and Juliet, Othello, not to mention all, uh, Othello, sorry, uh, not to mention all of the history plays are all adaptations, they're not original plot. Shakespeare's genius was not in plot, but in style and in innovation. 
His plays prove what could be done with a medium and cemented their place in our cultural history as great art. The stories he told had been told before in several other ways by several other people, but Shakespeare told them on the stage in English poetry, innovating both the medium and the language to such degree that neither could be ignored and both demanded critical and popular attention forever afterward. Video games stand in much the same place that English theater stood before Shakespeare. And every day, video games come closer to the moment of their own Shakespeare. Someone or some team who can take this undervalued medium and show the world its power through innovation. Uh, several games are already attempting to prove this. Sumitu so Ueda's Eco uh, is about a boy and a girl trying to escape from the castle. And the player controls the boy and must, if he wants the girl to come with him, press a button to hold the girl's hand and lead her along. Um, and so every time you do this, is an emotional experience in the game. Because you go and you explore alone, and then you have to come back and find her and go with her. Uh, Chris Wellentrop wrote of this experience, My first time doing it gave me goosebumps. I am with her. I am not alone, he said. Uh, through simple interactions like this, video games can create real emotional bonds that matter to players and provide fertile ground for artistic interpretation. 2012's Journey from the small uh, developer team, That Game Company, presents players with a difficult journey to a distant mountain and the choice to go it alone or with an anonymous online companion. Journalist Matt Miller writes, each time I played Journey, without fail, individual moments, particularly the final level, level, managed to give me goosebumps, and those moments have remained in my mind for weeks afterward. My own experience with the game left me with genu genuine feelings of compassion toward a complete stranger as we help each other succeed. We often praise art for its ability to foster empathy, but Journey goes one step further, not just fostering empathy, but giving you the opportunity to perform <coughs> empathy by helping someone, a stranger, make it through a difficult journey. Uh, this year's Bioshock Infinite from Irrational Games take on several major themes, including choice and consequence, racism, religion, and American exceptionalism. Adam Sessler said of its story and world, it can only work as a game. The unique agency and complicity of the player in the game's narrative is part of its commentary. This isn't a game filled with player choice, but it is the best game about the choices we make as a person and a people, their consequences, and their uncertainty about solution. Finally, June 2013's release, The Lax of Us, from studio Naughty Dog, masterfully pulls a player into the role of a damaged father in a post-pandemic world, and rivals Cormac McCarthy's The Road, and draws much from it, an emotional power and thematic depth. Games like these prove that video game medium is not only capable of taking on the same themes Shakespeare himself explored, but powerful enough to deliver those themes straight to the heart of the audience like no other medium has. Shakespeare won his battle for legitimacy so well that he has risen through the centuries to become a sort of patron saint of art in our culture. Roger Ebert said about his own debates over the legitimacy of video games, sooner or later, these arguments all get around to Shakespeare and have a way of running aground on him. So perhaps the ultimate litmus test of whether video games are a legitimate cultural medium would be to try to adapt one of Shakespeare's own plays to a video game. Chris Bateman, uh, author of Beyond Game Design, Nine Steps Toward Creating Better Video Games, said in an interview with me, most of the histories and all of the comedies of errors are open to adaptation, in my estimation, and many would produce very interesting experiences. He then quickly added, note that I don't think existing game genre formats would work for these game adaptations. You need to be creative in designing new approaches. I believe that not only could such adaptations succeed in taking video games a giant leap forward, they could also enhance understanding of the plays themselves for millions of players otherwise unfamiliar with Shakespeare. Uh, so while it might not stay this way, the current industry standard length for a narrative-driven game is around 15 to 20 hours. This investment expectation would allow for the entire text of any Shakespeare play to occur within a game adaptation, as well as several hours of extra gameplay material to further immerse the player in the experience and allow room for thought, exploration, and reflection. So consider, for instance, the ways the following aspects of The Tempest could be adapted into a video game version. So first, Prospero and Caliban. And this is actually a screenshot from the video game Star Wars The Old Republic. There's a whole Tumblr website dedicated to putting Shakespeare quotes on top of screenshots from this game. <laughs> <laughs> but Caliban and Prospero's relationship could be explored interestingly in a game. Uh, we don't know how long it took Prospero to enslave Caliban. We don't know how long it took Prospero to uh, gain his knowledge of his, of his magic through his books. And so the player could be given the opportunity to create this experience. The 
player could meet Caliban and at first not want to enslave him because moral grounds, we don't want to enslave anyone. But it could be through the game, the player learns that to survive on this island and to survive with his daughter and to move forward, he has to use his magic to enslave Caliban. So this would introduce a new theme into our interpretation of the Tempest. Usually we talk of Caliban as a native that the Europeans enslaved, bringing up themes of uh, colonization. But this interpretation could tell the player that maybe Prospero was doing something a little different than what we usually think of. However, the player could also choose to disenslave Caliban and therefore interpret for themselves that Prospero is a domineering uh, European colonizer. So secondly, the Trinculo and Stefano subplot could be interesting explored in the game. Following the tradition of interactive productions of Shakespeare, such as Punch Drunk's Sleep No More, and even other video games like Bioshock, this subplot could be hidden within the game world rather than forced upon the player. Um, as Ken Levine, creative director, of the, creative director for the Bioshock series said, when people find stuff, they feel like it's theirs. So rather than force the plot upon the player, these scenes could go on and the player could either enter the scene or move on as Prospero and go find something else to do. This let the player find the subplot while navigating through the island in pursuit of the main narrative would naturally open up more interest in these side characters and could help realize the same power this subplot was meant to have on the stage. Comedic relief and absurdity, yes, but also plot depth and range of perspective. Uh, these subplot moments could also introduce uh, absurd mini-games, such as an untangled Trinculo and Caliban puzzle game, for example, to draw out the comedic elements in a way that might be missed by an inexperienced reader trudging through the text of the play. So this hidden subplot would also invite the replay of the game, as perhaps players focus on the main action the first time around, then go through the game again to find all these hidden subplots and understand the full text. Uh, third, the theme of vision versus reality. Some moments of the Tempest seem more relevant to a gamer community than any other group of people in human history. Prospero's speech in Act 4, for instance, seems directed right at gamers. He says, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, ye all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. This comes in direct response to Ferdinand's wish, let me live here ever, so rare and a wondered father and wise, makes this place paradise. A wish surely shared by many a gamer toward their own game worlds, to stay in the, in the vision rather than return to reality. A player controlling Prospero, suddenly forced to stop these visions after hearing what Ferdinand says, would naturally reflect on the meaning of Prospero's speech in a way that teachers and directors and actors try to draw out of people, um, but this way it would happen naturally. So finally, the theme of vision versus reality could reach a level deeper than even any stage production at the end of the game with Prospero's final speech. He says, now my charms are all our throne, and what strength I have mine own, which is most faint. Now tis true, I must be here confined by you or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got and pardoned the deceiver, dwell in this fair island by your spell, but release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. Having played the game as Prospero in first person, having been interpolated, <laughs> um, now the player could, it could shift to a third person perspective, so Prospero is speaking directly to the player these final lines, and then Prospero could wait and expect the player to literally fulfill the injunction, release me from my bands with the help of your good hands, by not advancing until the player turns off the controller and accepts his command. After some time of great confusion and even frustration before discovering this, the moment would surely stick in the player's mind long after turning off the TV and leaving the game. The same point Shakespeare made with these lines about the difference between fantasy and reality and the need for both, and especially the need to understand the limits of both, would be made in a powerful, emotionally charged way that requires the player to physically and literally fulfill Prospero's request. Such an ending would leave players otherwise unfamiliar with Shakespeare understanding and talking about The Tempest like no other medium of production could achieve. So video games may not have their Shakespeare yet, but with how the industry has grown and the strides it has taken, with all the possibilities that are now open to the medium and innovations that have already been made to achieve those possibilities, such a powerful, legitimizing influence cannot be far off. Video games can and will win their cultural legitimacy, and in the not-too-distant future, children and adults alike will sit down to play a video game not just for entertainment, 
but for some of the most powerful and emotional cultural experiences of their lives. Experiences that will lift, enlighten, and provoke thought along with the very best art of humanity.